um, we convinced Georgina Hulrich to uh, lecture with us tonight. Georgina, of course, teaches here. I, I think that's very well known. And this is also for us uh, a really uh, great thing that we can do this because we like to hear from each other. And um, I think it is also really important that also for you all, not to only have Georgina on the other side, uh, which is still on the other side, but to have her uh, as a peer, so um, to compare work, to compare notes, and hopefully ask her a lot of questions. So I demand some questions from you guys. Um, anyway, Georgina, uh, together with Marcelo Spina, she has an office in LA called Patterns, uh, a leading architectural practice, uh, I think 15 years old, roughly. Yeah, I could not find that, actually. Roughly, so I put 2005 with a question mark, uh, but when was it? Well, I know it's Yeah, yeah, so it's steps. Okay, good. That's amazing. Well, it got much better, of course, after that. Yeah. Um, and they have completed projects in uh, Los Angeles, California, um, America in general, Asia, and uh, South America. Um, as both are from Argentina, actually, which is an amazing place. We know a lot of really talented people from there. Uh, their work has been exhibited worldwide, most notably at the Venice Biennale in Italy, the <laughs> Chicago Biennale, the Art Institute of Chicago, the San Francisco, San Francisco MoMA, the Vienna Mack Museum, uh, and also in that museum they have, uh, they're part of the permanent collection. But before I keep going about Georgina and patterns, I first want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, it's always great to see you back every year. Ewing Cole, um, I think six alum, right? Six alum from Penn, so that is really amazing. So happy to, is it six? Five, five, five today. Five, um, the sixth one we also still love. Uh, and they established this fund in 2002 to support a lecture here and um, ask us to find a distinguished architect that we feel is worth their fund. So obviously, no we, we no pressure <laughs> and we managed. And tonight we're joined by several Ewing Co. Representat representatives, the majority of which are the alums. So it's Ryan, likewise. Sorry, I pronounce that European. Andrew, <laughs> is it good? Yeah, you do that too, like that? Oh my God, that's amazing. That was kind of my Austrian side. Andrew Donaldson Evans, Katina Healy, Yuan Ma, Ashton Amspacher, and Logan Weaver, who was actually also a student of Georgina, so that's double fun, I would say. Thank you for your support, and thank you for joining us and joining us for the dinner. Um, Going back to Georgina, her most recent 700 studio was called Fuzzy Aggregate, Speculations on New Forms of Mixed Use, where she um, worked on generating a new kind of urbanism, aggregate and fuzzy, intensive and extensive, within a historic central site in Barcelona. Georgina's studios are imag imaginative, compelling, and a challenge, uh, challenge the way we perceive and create architecture. I also mentioned the Grease Studio, which I also really loved, where Logan was a student. Uh, she's also an adjunct, uh, associate adjunct professor at UCLA, where she is an alum. Uh, and she graduated in her master's there and before that in Rosario uh, in Argentina. Uh, she has been a visiting professor at Yale, obviously here, USC Berkeley, TIT in Tokyo, and Ditella University in Buenos Aires. She has previously worked for the Guggenheim Museum, interesting, I didn't know that, uh, the architectural firm Dean Wolf, uh, architects in New York City, and as a project designer at Morphosis, and we know Morphosis in Los Angeles. Their largest building to date, the Victoria Healthcare, needs, uh, nears completion as we speak. It entails the conversion of an existing warehouse into medical offices, and it's located in North Hollywood, so we're really hoping you show us that. And their proposal for the Janoyan, is that the right way, Janoyan? 
was unanimously approved by Glendale City Council, uh, clearing an important hurdle towards the construction of it. This new project will uh, bring a significant contemporary addition to the Glendale Civic Center, a community health center known for its social services to the poor and <coughs> uninsured within Glendale. Super exciting, and we hope to see this soon, is uh, their new book called Mute Icons, the same title as uh, the lecture tonight, by Akhtar Press, a book realis realized, realized with the help of the Graham Grant. Mute Icons and Other Dichotomies of the Real in Architecture is going to press and will be released in the summer of 2020. It's interrogating historical, contemporary, and more importantly, speculative images. Pattern with this book aims to carve out a niche in contemporary culture and history by suggesting that far from being a crowd pleaser, as they say, that's not my words, architecture can persist within society as a constructive cultural and social irritant. In 2011, Patterns integrated the Emerging Voices series of uh, Architecture League in New York and was the recipient of ARC IS award by the AIA LA chapter. They have received numerous other prizes and awards, including the American Architecture Award, an ACSA Faculty Award, four AIA uh, LA Honor and Merit Awards, and an AIA National Design Review Award. In 2013, Marcelo Spina and Georgina Hulrich were the recipients of a prestigious USA Artist Gregor Fellowship an endowment that recognizes America's most accomplished and innovative artists. And I have to say, one of the things I really love about their practice is not only their buildings and their book upcoming, but also the fact that uh, they do uh, sets for plays. I was, so, was lucky to see one. And it is really amazing to see architects designing sets for theater plays, because it brings a whole other dimension, I think, to architecture and the way we view architecture. And, you know, between all the discussions of the human, non-human, to see uh, actors actually interact on stage with that architecture. So having said that, please join me welcoming Georgina to give her lecture tonight. Okay, um, so let me figure out. Okay, well, thanks, Winka, so much for having me, and thanks to the sponsors also for the invitation. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I have a cold, so forgive my, my voice on top of my accent, so it's gonna get kind of complicated, but anyhow. So um, I guess, I mean, as, uh, Winka mentioned um, all the work that I'm presenting today uh, has to be, of course, credited to, to Marcelo um, Spina and all the talented people that um, has worked with us in our office for the last, I don't know, like 10 to 20, uh, to 10, uh, 20 years. So um, you wonder why I'm starting a lecture about mute icons with a photograph of um, Johnny Depp. Well, this is uh, Dead Man. It's a film um, from 1995. Uh, uh, directed by Jim Harmash about, uh, if you haven't seen it, please, you have to watch this. Uh, but it was about the spiritual journey of uh, William Blake. William Blake was an icon of his time, and he was someone that, um, he was someone, someone that hardly spoke and just listened, and um, his behavior was always framed by a, a very particular context. So the film is actually very slow and, and uh, both in rhythm and pace, and the use of the poetic and somewhat uh, unexplained uh, symbols um, in a way lead to a simplicity of a story that even with a film that has so many different layers and, and levels, uh, all of these coexist in a way where um, actually none of them or without one actually taking uh, precedence. So regardless of the, the muteness and the austerity of William Blake, um, he actually didn't lack uh, character. Um, indeed, he actually had a priest, um, unique and a strange character. And by any means, I'm trying to make a parallel or a direct parallel of these two architecture. However, 
I mean, I believe, I guess, I know, most of us that nowadays we live in an epoch of um, economic austerity and social consciousness and perhaps um, eh, engaged with an often or maybe ill-proclaimed um, but certainly perceived uh, death of the um, icon. So, um, it is indeed a time in architecture and the world um, with social and cultural uh, values that are at stake and with destructive polarizations. I'm sorry I was just so charged this morning that I, I needed to uh, make reference of this, but it is indeed a time without, uh, or at least within architecture, it's a time without clear ideolog uh, ideologies and very clear lines of criticism, and maybe in part is a, sequence, as a consequence of how rapidly architecture needs to adapt to the current status of the world where uh, global forces are certainly at stake and intervening, um, intervening at the very core of what we do as architects. So maybe that's a reason there is a, almost a perception of no real avant-garde, uh, but rather a much more conservative approach to uh, architecture, maybe also representation and certain levels of revisionism, revisionism of, uh, I'm sorry, of um, both historicism and, and neo-postmodernism in the air. Um, and well, I guess I'm realizing, and I might be a total downer uh, here, but uh, bear with me, I think I'm gonna make a, a much more uh, optimistic claim at some point. But um, ultimately, I think it's, um, or at least uh, the focus of, of my lecture today, is really about the role of, um, of uh, it's assuming that the role of the architectural icon needs to come under a very deep examination and its cultural persistent, um, uh, persistence requires a fundamental question, which is what constitutes an icon uh, nowadays. You might remember the, um, you might remember the comment by the Chinese president uh, some, some years ago saying no more weird buildings, addressing the OMA uh, CCTV uh, project as uh, being one of them. So what's, what does it really mean for um, architecture to actually have to face cultural and political criticism that in a way seems to be pushing uh, backward? So, I, um, I, we, I mean, as a practice, and, and, and uh, but also, I mean, personally, in the way that I develop, in the work that I develop, um, uh, also with my students, I deeply believe in the continuity and the the importance and the cultural relevance of the icon. Yet, we agree that the icon has uh, come under stress, and we need to uh, reimagine it. So, what is an architectural icon? Um, today. Maybe it's partially about uh, the need to engage with new or maybe with different uh, values of, of beauty and aesthetics or perhaps um, or perhaps has to deal with the idea of uh, rejecting ornament or even further from the moment that um, there is a substantial amount of uh, skepticism on formal expression, there is maybe the necessity to neutralize it and to adopt a much more modest attitude towards a contest, a context. So, I know, maybe it's also perhaps, uh, it's about a, a renewed version of uh, Venturi's notion of the difficult whole. So, um, I have to say I don't necessarily have an answer, but um, I have a position about this, and I think this is, um, these three images uh, have something to do with this idea. This is sort of a, maybe a silly hypothesis, but one that I think helps to understand the point that I'm trying to make. None of these images are less real than the other ones. They're all facts. They're all clouds. So, but they're all presented in opposition. They, they're presented as a series of dichotomies that are being understood in isolation. So there is an image, um, there is a, the image which portrays the cloud. Then there is a shape of the cloud, which I call the, the Pomo cloud. And then there is the material composition of the cloud, which is, I mean, it's a diagram of the, um, of the cloud. So 
I guess our interest in um, dichotomies and bring us to be very curious about these kind of uh, vague and strange images that promote, somehow promote a newness um, a, and a kind of maybe forward-looking idea of what the culture of the image uh, can be. So um, this is... Okay. Okay, so this is the opening sequence of uh, True Detective, um, another series of watch. In a weird, I'm not being paid by any movie channels today, just, just you know. Um, so in a, weird, in a very weird way, um, context and subject that all collapse together and they try to convey a much stronger narrative and yet to confuse the image itself. So because basically what you have are two different images that are flickering of each other and um, they're producing a third constituent uh, which is a strange and it's also unusual and its content is not uh, necessarily uh, apparent. So, oops. So this is, um, this is how the notion of muteness um, in this context and ultimately mute iconicity, I think, comes into place. And, and as the title suggested, uh, mute icon is presented in a dichotomy as two different terms that operate in opposition um, and that need to establish, uh, still need to establish a very productive dialogue. And their properties are not to be necessarily negotiated or cross it. Um, they are to actually operate as analogies, but in contradiction. So, as Winka was mentioning, this is our um, upcoming book, um, Mute Icons and Other Dichotomies of the Real in Architecture, um, in the works for five years. That's what these kind of things take. And uh, the book intends to complete a line of research that both Marcelo and I uh, have developed in the last maybe six to seven years, both academically with our students from different institutions, uh, but also professionally within the context of our practice. Um, the book is um, ultimately about presenting very provocative and speculative uh, parallel images that are both contemporary and uh, historical and which promote uh, what we like to, to think as almost impossible conversations with projects and with architects that actually we admire, that we have lectured and we have uh, thought about. And. Um, And we do this as a way to also dissect and look at our own work from that uh, particular perspective. So the book specifically elaborates on a series of dichotomies that um, promote the comparison, as I said, between um, the historical and um, a historical precedents with our work and some contemporary precedents as well. And the, these dichotomies are expressed through terms such as um, incongruity or disparity or relative autonomy or physical abstraction texture and fuzziness and so on and so forth. And um, it's all about, I mean, actually, like trying to see what is that threshold in between these opposites and where and you know, both can coexist uh, simultaneously and, and still each of them keep a certain degree of um, discreteness of our, or autonomy. So I will keep going on and on about the book, but I'm gonna leave that for um, when everybody comes to The, the, the launch of the book, uh, hopefully in um, the summer 2020. So, as you know, um, I mean, as also Winka presented, um, this is, we have our office, our base is in um, downtown Los Angeles, and um, we have a staff that moves from two and a half to 12 people at any given time. Um, and I mean, as a small office, I mean, that's how fluctuates, and you guys know that too. But actually, we are from Argentina, and we have a global practice, but we are based in Los Angeles. And hopefully, I mean, some of these quotes uh, speak quite clearly about what actually means to practice in, um, in Los Angeles, what it means to actually be part of a city that has so many attractive contradictions as 
yeah, I don't want to live in a city where the only cultural advantage is that you can make a right turn in a red light, right? I mean, that's it's brilliant. So now the professional pitch, and I guess I mean it's a, it's a, the actual import. It, it's really important to address the um, how our very tight relationship to both practice and academia. And I know I mean it sounds a cliche, but I must say that is a pretty true one, uh, but how it um, expresses our deep interest in architecture, not just presented as a built reality, but um, also as a line or several lines of research uh, throughout our careers and at very specific or given times. So this, um, in a way, I mean, this serves as an introduction to the second part of the lecture um, where I will be showing you, I'll be presenting a series of prof professional works that are all framed around, or at least presented around the, um, the conceptual uh, framework of the book and the conceptual dichotomies. And these are all projects that, in a way, overwrite geographies, um, overwrite scale. Um, they, I don't know, they, they operate from Los Angeles to Indonesia, from small scale installations to large mixed use developments. Some of them built, most of them unbuilt or in the process to be completed, uh, but all of them with a, almost a recurrent uh, challenge of what it means to practice uh, globally. So, um, I'm gonna move very quick through all of them because actually, again, the, the point that I'm making is more about the relationship between them rather than uh, the projects themselves. Um, this is a mosque in Kosovo where, I mean, within the framework of objecthood or monolithicity, um, is being or is presented as being independent from the ground and it denies context and promotes ideas of um, autonomy. Or, for example, if referring to to ideas of uh, fuzziness or texture. This is a student dormitory in Puerto Rico. Um, there is a complete disguise of size and a scale. There is a suppression or even maybe the, the subversion of uh, conventional architectural elements or part to call relationships. This is actually, I mean, a, a eight story building and it could be you know, 20. Um, these are four projects in Budapest. Uh, it is a family of what we call fuzzy uh, mute icons where all the objects are dispersed in a neoclassical uh, park in the center of the city. They operate much as a cultural fortress. They are all autonomous objects or perhaps uh, maybe pseudo autonomous objects in relationship to a green field or a park. And we understand these objects, these are, these are four competitions, we lost all four of them. And um, even though we understand these objects as being autonomous in the context of what um, they are as building objects, but we also uh, understand them through a completely different um, a context which is being immersed in, a, in what could be a hyper real yet fictional uh, experiential reality. Um, so, I know, meaning, I mean, we move back and forth between the I know, a pure abstraction and a, a fictional reality. So actually we spend a lot of time placing the buildings in their context so, um, so we can see what are the effects that they would produce in a particular setting. So they're either, usually they're either elevations or one point perspectives and the idea of the object is, uh, for example, in this case is to appear more as a negative um, rather than the positive or in this case where the building is not even in the center of the composition but is pushed to the right um, that in a way expresses that ultimately we are interested in I mean, in buildings and in building, but we're also interested in building and constructing images as well. And as a recurrent condition of our work, um, we are um, building or constructing images that uh, they all have very specific context. And to us, context really matters. So when, for example, when we work on this, we indeed invest much more time working on constructing the scene to then place the, um, place the building. So we went even further 
Um, this is for an invitation to the Chicago Biennale uh, some uh, years ago. Having lost the, the Budapest competitions, we decided to reconstruct the entire scene of the park by taking over 200 photographs with a low flying uh, plane. And we did that because uh, we were interested in assembling, um, uh, assembling um, them, but in an orthographic mode, so that's why the, you know, the, the way that we had to take the photographs, uh, and then we proceeded to photo montage um, our projects in there. And um, this was a, collaborati a collaboration with uh, Casey Rem, and basically what we did was uh, to glitch portions of the park to produce a mural, almost like a, a, a Monet, if I could ever dare to, to compare, uh, but it's a, it's a mural where the canvas goes from image to glitch and where the image then gets completely decomposed um, and then this is used as a technique to then articulate um, or like to give some, some ideas uh, or rise to the tectonics of the, um, of the buildings. So um, Also vague and um, indeterminate, uh, but also fuzzy and uh, monolithic. It, this was an immersive installation for Sonos Studios in Los Angeles. Uh, it was a, almost like a, a, an emotional connection between music and space and pattern. This was actually following the, um, a, the parameters of a, of a TV campaign that they were, um, they were producing. So in this case, projections and materials, they are all distorting and uh, mispresenting form, very similar to the big canvas for the, for, uh, the park in, um, in Budapest. And um, in a way they create uh, three somewhat indeterminate yet construct, uh, very construct, contrasting sorry, environments. Um, a very, in a much smaller scale, and um, this is fuzzy monolith. Luckily, we stopped calling things fuzzy. That I think we just got bored of that. Uh, this was a close, uh, the close-up exhibition at SciArc a few uh, years ago. And we actually looked at uh, Frank Stella's uh, black paintings to, in a way, instill a sense of uh, maybe tectonic constructivism to the often much more painterly and two-dimensional approach to texture on the surface of uh, buildings. So rather than keeping the digitally generated uh, pixelation as um, just as being superficial, uh, we basically translated it into the abstract language of lines and uh, pixels into, um, I mean, as a, almost as a proto-architecture for material assemblies. And this notion was then, I mean, or it, it was easily translated, or easily, nothing is easy, but it was translated into this small, but actually rather significant project for us that was commissioned by the Center for the Arts of Performance at uh, UCLA. It's just a table, no, nothing more than, than a table, uh, but it used to be used in a series of uh, dinners with patrons and donors and artists, and even if it's a small piece, it was quite relevant to us, not just for the institutional context from which this piece was being conceived, uh, but also for the challenge to test ideas across a scale that actually we are not very uh, familiar with. But what's also really interesting to us is that through abstraction, we can also think about, uh, or we can, we can get into problems of narrative and problems of engagement uh, through the arts. It was actually I mean, the first time that we were actually working for um, a, an art um, or visual arts institution. So luckily we had the, I know, we, we were lucky uh, and we continued with a series of collaborations with artists. Uh, we just completed a White Album. Um, this is a stage design for um, Lars Chan's adaptation of Sean Didion's um, White Album. It's around 30 feet long, and the, maybe the, the most novel thing about this was that it had to be uh, assembled and disassembled in, um, in one day by a very small crew of just like two or three 
uh, people. Um, the project then, I mean, it was, this, the reason is that it was conceived as a, as a, for a traveling performance, where then the structure had to take on uh, functionality, including simplicity and pace of assembly, economy of means and uh, maintenance in the most uh, serious and economical um, way. So uh, we actually use a flexible uh, space uh, truss system where we could then hide all the artifices of uh, the box and um, leave room for everything that was needed for, um, uh, for the performance. But I must admit that to us, uh, maybe the most interestingly uh, aspect of this project was that its radicality uh, was much less about architecture, but um, it was more about the social issues and the narrative uh, that takes uh, place, in this case going back to the, um, to the 60s and by the, um, let's see, and by the essay itself, where architecture was just simply giving it a frame. So this is another version of an art gallery um, and the challenge to the white box. Um, this is Prism Gallery in West Hollywood. Physical abstraction, in this case, uh, expressed in the, in the dual uh, aesthetic performance of the facade. Uh, it behaves as a reflective glossy surface during the day, um, which motivates the relationship of the building with the culture of the automobile um, in the iconic Sunset Boulevard, but also as a much more translucent container when lit from um, inside at night. Uh, and the interior as a white box and another form of physical abstraction and the moment where the facade begins to intrude the interior. And maybe material abstraction, but in its ultimate um, state, this is a project that was commissioned by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, also in collaboration with Casey Rees, uh, where the pavilion, uh, this is for the show Sculpturalism some years ago, where the pavilion is not necessarily um, bound by connections between parts, but rather by the physical abstraction of different composites that take place and are within, the, within the object itself, uh, which move away from traditional um, uh, building processes. Um, oops. Okay, so. So ultimately this project uh, presented the, um, uh, the possibility to uh, work with extreme lightweight materials um, in architecture. This is all carbon fiber, um, which I mean, both physically and experientially uh, blurs the threshold between hard and soft and textile and tectonic and um, intimate and public. Actually, the carbon uh, fiber uh, radiating patterns serve as a canvas for the installation from KC Res, uh, which consisted on, consisted on different films in Los Angeles uh, that were working at different speeds and they, they were projected. There was a whole choreograph between how the film was projected onto uh, each of the, the surfaces, almost like a grain in a specific uh, about the grain, it was fiber by fiber. So um, ultimately, this is, I mean, we tried to do the same thing in this other building, we couldn't, it was impossible because of um, a budget and you know, methods of construction uh, in general, but this is uh, League of Shadows, this is in the parking lot of Sciarc in downtown Los Angeles. It's a very interesting case of a small project that actually has built quite a bit of reputation um, in the way uh, that it behaves, 
um, but not only because of its rather significant physical present, uh, presence, it's five, story, um, five stories tall, but also because of its uh, location. It's in this corner in um, downtown and has a double life. On the one hand, it's almost like an, it has the obvious function of um, serving as an outdoor uh, event or public event space. It's a graduation pavilion, uh, but also there is a, more, a much more iconic performance, um, which is that it almost operates as a billboard um, that reasserts Sayark's uh, institutional presence in uh, downtown Los Angeles. So we move away from the very traditional typology of a pavilion, uh, constructing a shape that would actually cast its own shadow on the ground, so it would be real, I mean, or it would behave as a real functioning uh, apparatus. Many architects, I think, I mean, have, have done really good jobs at um, really good projects um, within the typology of pavilions, but I think they, in, in, in many cases, they failed to the very simple idea of keeping a thousand plus people two hours in the middle of the summer uh, with a breeze and under the um, under a shade. So um, this project has not only achieved that, but it's, uh, it has done that also taking the least amount of parking in an area where parking is actually very limited. So by positioning um, the object or the pavilion vertically, then the pavilion produces, or the wall, uh, produces enough shadow uh, when all these events are held. And um, the, uh, no, it basically depicts very simple uh, volumes from the street that are then carved um, unified surfaces on the inside or on the interior, if there is such interior. And it actually promotes or offers this dual uh, reading. One which is a very complex uh, superficial texture at a very close range, but also a kind of a mute view from the street uh, and a very simple outline from far away. Uh, people texturing the ground and um, then the very clear tripartite outline and how it relates uh, with the context of um, a downtown LA as a backdrop. But what it's really interesting about um, these kind of you know, highly exposed um, uh, to the public projects is the fact that many of these photos or these images we no longer owned. I mean, they were they are just you know, in Instagram or social media, and so we have no control on that. So these are all collections of images that actually happen in all these different mediums um, where. Um, other institutions or agencies uh, that are operating nearby reinforce the idea of how context uh, is constantly rearticulating the narrative of the project. For example, this is, you know, in, in this case, the image is constructing the, the context is a case of the Santa Clarita fire in Los Angeles some years ago. So uh, we couldn't even have imagined such a powerful image in the, um, I mean, for us. So um, ultimately, uh, we and we as architects, um, I mean, we, we make projects and we make buildings and we make forms, but we don't make icons. Um, it's people and it's culture and, and it's time that makes uh, icons. So we try to make architecture, we try to make actually very meaningful and relevant buildings that can then maybe hint into the problem. Uh, or the problematic of iconicity in some particular way, but we actually have no control um, on that. So, um, oops. No, sorry, oops. Here we are. So, as I said, culture absorbs uh, projects and in some way you know, it turns them into images and then scenes and films. For example, this is a TV series, Fearing, um, Fear the Walking Dead, where they didn't even, I mean, or the, the entire context is depicted as, you know, with zombies and, and in the street and buildings are burning and, and there is this apocalyptic atmosphere. However, 
nobody bothered to do anything to the pavilion. That stayed as, as it was. So, um, it was great. Um, so, now context, I mean, maybe, or talking about context under a, a, in a completely different uh, case, it is uh, here translated into um, what we would call a strange vernacular, where we actually question um, how we can conceive newness when the vernacular framework is so constrained. So these are four projects that, um, these are for the same client, a, a hotelier, uh, which is, uh, who is extremely interested in working on remote islands and which present uh, to us a unique opportunity um, in terms of exploring the possibilities posed by this question of uh, how we can create a character that is not purely historic while, I mean, still solely um, using and, and kind of you know, being, being uh, constrained, um, productively constrained, I would say, by local materials, local co uh, culture, manufacturing processes, uh, etc., given their very remote uh, location. So the first one is located in uh, the middle of the island of Bali in Indonesia, where the entire cladding of the building is executed in uh, with black volcanic rock is the most efficient and, and cheap material on the island. And imagine what a paradise for us not being able to work with any other material um, uh, or any other color but black. It was great. And, uh, and of course, the reference also to Hindu temples and you know, the use of color, the use of ornament um, and uh, materials um, since it was located further um, actually far from the coast, the building then opens up as a, um, to a lighter and bright interior void where then all the balconies uh, maximize the views towards the, the sea, which is actually uh, further back. Um, it's also autonomous and, uh, or it has a, a character of autonomy, but it's also contextual and, um, I mean, moves back and forth between this idea of I mean, always been responsive to that very close co uh, uh, context, but also, I mean, almost like acquiring an, an independent life by itself. Uh, similar ideas for a resort in uh, Bequi in the Caribbean, um, in this case with very strong references to configurations of villages, uh, buildings, huts, and bamboo as a primary, um, as a primary material. Um, we also managed to paint the bamboo black here which um, it's not built, but still kind of uh, within the, the conceptual uh, phase. And uh, back to Bali, this time on the coast, and the expansion of an existing, um, of an existing resort. In this case, um, I mean, besides materials, construction methods, uh, social and cultural parameters, there is also the, the reference to landscape and rice uh, terraces that, um, that, of course, I mean, offer a lot of ideas for the manipulation of landscape and the, 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 the articulation of the, of the section in the, um, in the building. Uh, and again, the, the use of volcanic rock and um, the reference to the Balinese uh, huts. A, for pro, a fourth project uh, within this family is a master plan in Gilimino. It's another uh, island also off, um, off Bali. These are approximately 80 villas and a large beach club. Um, all these projects are in the works, um, hopefully you know, happening at some point. Um, we'll see. And I mean, maybe it's fair to say that also the, the vernacular also comes in in many types and forms. We are now um, in South America, specifically in Argentina, with uh, a single family house and dealing with uh, maybe different, different ideas of landscape, but the use of local materials and, and labor, in this case, concrete. Um, and the opportunity to, um, 
or maybe the opportunistic act of having to use concrete, not just to comply with the, the local, um, these local methods but, uh, or local vernacular, but also to be able to achieve problems of plasticity and forming and inflection and torsion on, um, and how, how to insert newness um, in typologies that are actually highly established, at least in Argentina, which is a single family house. That's exactly, and I think that's universal, right? Not just, not just in Argentina. So, um, interior, and maybe the same would be fair to say also that the same issue of plastility was addressed in this corporate headquarters in Chengdu, in um, China, uh, different maybe from the house in Argentina, which um, I think, well, this building exposes a, a much more, um, much clearer idea of incongruity through problems of um, a torsion and maybe a sensibility to trying to change balance and weight and uh, vision while uh, still like producing a sense of uh, continuity, in this case an oblique continuity between um, interior and exterior, uh, wall and ceiling, discrete and monolithic. Uh, the discrete taking places at the, and two of the, the edges of the mass where the diagonal runs through uh, the building and then uh, in contrast with uh, the smoothness of the concrete negotiating the apertures uh, with the vertical metal panels in the maybe most normative uh, part of the building. So this is how the um, diagonal organizes the plan and, um, and much more oops, visible the condition of the two, of the two single moments um, at the edges of the building. Continuity and incongruity, I mean also like to find points of relationships between projects that actually differ quite drastically in terms of um, when they were built. I mean, this is not necessarily in chronological order and, and purposely, uh, but this is an old building, actually the first building that Marcelo and I got to uh, build. Um, this is in Rosario in, in Argentina, our hometown, which bas basically explores the idea of a vertical um, stacking, vertical repetition and differentiation, and, um, and using that as a potential for uh, structural change. So in this case, the, um, the intention was to generate continuity through, like between the horizontal layer of the uh, slabs and the extension on the balcony, uh, which then folds up and down um, conforming all the balconies and towards the following, the following floor. But then this evolved into, this was maybe six or seven years after, it evolved into the younger, um, for now the youngest, because it's not a third one, but, but much more robust uh, sibling of the previous building. It's just two blocks away from, uh, from the previous one, uh, also same client. And this project was done in collaboration with Maxi Spina. I have to say that he was actually an, an instrumental person in the project and um, consists basically on, uh, it's a nine story uh, housing, a, a multifamily apartment. Um, and, oops. And in this case, um, instead, of, instead of working on like purely on the problem of stacking as we did with the other building, this was much more about using the balconies as the, the fine lines that allow for the manipulation of the mass, uh, both at the scale of the overall volume, uh, but also at the scale of each of the apartments. So the balconies are the result of the inflections um, of the mass to allow them um, to be embedded in the building instead of having an, or operating as an extrusion of the slab as we are maybe much more used to. Uh, the balconies uh, working as uh, pockets and how integrated they are with the mass of the uh, building. The lobby and the common amenities on the rooftop. White on white, in this case, also painting, it's all concrete, 
pretty much, but uh, all painted uh, white to motivate a, a more like more of a tactile sensation between materials. And maybe that's a good um, bridge to talk about, um, I mean, now moving from Argentina now to Greece, and uh, specifically the island of Mykonos. Um, this is, a, we have a few experts here on the project. Uh, the client, our client actually also um, worked with us in the, in the studio and very generously took all the students to, um, uh, to one, his house there. But this is actually a different client. This is a different, same context, different, um, different client. And um, of course, we didn't design this, of course, but um, we actually, we designed this villa. And, uh, but basically the project addresses again the question of the role of architectural autonomy in highly vernacular settings. We didn't, we weren't expecting to do something too different than, I mean, or we weren't allowed, but um, then again, I mean, how, how can you create newness? How can we do something uh, different? So uh, this is existing house. Basically, we had to keep the same, the same footprint of the project just to be able to be filed as a renovation. And um, basically, the, the project in, entitled approximately 6,000 square feet of very different programmatic uh, components, which um, allows us, allowed us to think about almost like a city within, within a city, or a, a series of interdependent volumes that would then, um, that, that could still be presented with a certain degree of autonomy. So uh, it was almost like a Greek uh, village. It was a collection of very old parts, small buildings and pavilions that never quite cohere into one single whole. And um, at the center of our strategy then is the, the need to add enough character uh, and autonomy to each of the parts, but at the same time, uh, every part needs to have a relationship of figural adjacency uh, with its uh, neighboring one, so they can all function independently and interdependently from um, each other. So um, ideas of um, texture, uh, composition, of course, only two materials that we could use were uh, limestone, uh, white limestone and, um, and just rock from the site. So um, outline and silhouette were really uh, were very important uh, within this uh, context. So this is um, this is what's happening now. Um, even with this, we don't know what's going to happen with the project. I know. Long story. That's for another lecture. Um, but yeah, this is how it is now, and we'll see. We're back in LA. And this is a project Winka mentioned under construction, very near completion, um, maybe a different kind of vernacular if there, anyone dares to say that there is a vernacular in Los Angeles. Um, and it's actually a new, it's almost like a, a new way of development in and around Los Angeles where um, now, I mean, there is a use of existing buildings and the reappropriation, reappropriation um, of buildings where densification um, has to I mean, kind of like operate that way just by recycling uh, existing buildings. So um, the building um, was a, which is the one on the, on the left, is a um, bowstring truss building where basically this is a existing, the existing one, um, it hosted a former supermarket in North Hollywood and basically we needed to um, add almost 17,000 square, um, I mean, it has, I'm sorry, 17,000 square feet right now. We need to um, uh, add to make up to 45,000. So basically we added a, um, a basement and extended the facade. So um, basically we cut three different courtyards within the big warehouse in order to promote for light and, um, and a certain sense of porosity in the building and, um, and actually work 
uh, really hard in terms of like trying to now create a public space in an area that otherwise would be you know, completely you know, isolated from the use of the uh, street. So the, uh, it's a healthcare facility. The office, the doctor offices are on the uh, second floor with a you know, very nice view and, um, and then the new basement and parking underneath. Um, maybe trying to bring some rain to LA, some word of, a, of an iconic um, elevation of the project, and this is just a few, this is a few months ago, um, and, oops, there. So this is, yeah, maybe two, three months ago, um, the interior, and this is just a few days ago. And um, actually here you can see the, I mean, the, the three courtyards and then the extension of the facade into the campus because they're planning to also fix the building across, a, across that public space. So um, yeah, this is just a few days ago and the, um, they are basically now cladding the building with uh, metal panels and then the treatment of the side walls in order to allow for the courtyards to have a much more fluid relationship to the uh, to the exterior of the building. And this is a project that Winka mentioned is, uh, we just got approval from the city of Glendale, um, and we are working on collaboration with Sharif Lynch Architecture. For some reason, another healthcare facility, um, completely different context from which uh, we got the commissions. Uh, but I think this, I mean, in this case, the project, um, uh, aims to contract a, a much more authentic dichotomy um, or dichotomic image, one that in a way refers or, or tries to confuse or be confused for a strange civic uh, building. I mean, it's right in the center of the city of Glendale with you know, the, the, the police quarters and the uh, and town hall Right, um, at, right next to it, uh, but then on the, other on the other hand, it is maybe too eccentric uh, to be privately used. So uh, we played, I know we played within that uh, realm, and um, basically, I know we work with a, a rather simple volume um, that is cladded in a dark tinted glass curtain wall, which is, I mean, basically uh, cuts diagonally uh, the building into a, this crystalline shape, which allows for a much more distinctive um, silhouette, um, and um, it crosses actually the two the two facades as a way to you know, produce a much more continuous condition uh, in the corner and a, a kind of a, a clear relationship between interior and uh, exterior. So while one of the facades is flat and is completely flush to the uh, street, the other one uh, faces, um, the other one facing the other street actually is what we would call much more you know, fuzzy. Um, and it has a repetitive um, series of brisolets or a brisolet system uh, over the glass curtain wall. So this also adds to a level of indeterminacy and aesthetic maybe clouding in the, uh, or to the building mass. A warm view from the, um, yeah, from below during the day and uh, how that cut begins to kind of like add this character of the building that otherwise wouldn't present and the same condition during the night. Um, the many hundreds or thousands of uh, instances that we went through before uh, the final one, how we choose, that's a secret. And, um, and some of the the renderings I mean, mostly needed to convince to convince a city, and um, that this is the right thing to do. Um, I still prefer our renderings better, and um, yeah. And I guess I mean this is like, for example, the the wall that terminates a building on one side, which for us was, I mean, extremely important in terms of producing almost a, a, like a complete muteness on that side of the building. I think that's the only criticism in the, in the public hearing. So we need to see what we do about that. 
Um, and then the problem of structure in here, which needs to be pushed back nine feet um, inside uh, the building so it can produce an overhand, which promotes a very clear idea of solid and void. So uh, the whole, I mean, in that sense, the whole core of the building, I mean, was discussed around that nine feet um, cantilever. That's for students that usually, you know, buildings cantilever 25. And, um, and then, I mean, this is, I mean, in relationship, it's almost like a Venturi moment. This is a, a Venturi and Scott Brown um, building in, in UCLA, where, um, I mean, the building is almost like being, uh, is perceived as being conformed by three isolated parts. So uh, they're all connected through this nine feet uh, reveal that I was talking about, uh, but then, I mean, the corner produces two, these two very, very different conditions of the bristle lace and the uh, courting wall. So um, there we are with going back to Venturi. And um, the Finns facade now meeting also the, um, meeting the frit glass and, I mean, in the most clear line possible and how it uh, performs in a very productive way to address issues of climate and heat and uh, environment, um, et cetera. So hopefully this is, as Winka said, has just been approved. Um, see these are done, we might move into breaking ground maybe in two, three months. Last but not least, um, this is a large scale mixed use project in Los Angeles um, and the constant discussion uh, about uh, gentrification. Uh, its comparison with the, uh, its counterparts in downtown Los Angeles and the main idea uh, of the project uh, trying to provide almost a, the, the experience of the LA living by an extensive indoor, outdoor living possibility and um, actually, yeah, try to experience Los Angeles but uh, vertically. Uh, the visual relationships between uh, the three towers, I mean, it's usual mixed-use components uh, with hotel, um, condos, and uh, retail, maybe some educational programs not yet defined, and uh, how these relationships of views and climate and sun orientation begin to shape the idea or, or the outline of the different amenities that are located, instead of just being placed within the twins of the building, they are located um, like throughout the trajectory of the towers. So um, the most clearly the idea of the vertical um, neighborhood and uh, how the you know, the life of the uh, the life of the apartments not being just limited to one tower or the city of Los Angeles, but also the relationship between uh, all three of them. Uh, changing the material effects through, um, I mean, on the facade through um, the actual materiality at different times of the day, and the perception of the mass uh, from far also at different, um, at different times. And this relationship between the, you know, the one and the many and the autonomous and the, um, uh, dependent, if we dare to say. More um, city renderings, so just came, and again, our rendering, and the city renderings, and our renderings, again. The view from the other side, this is from the freeway, and I think that the need of the non-happy image um, in this case, no blue skies and, and surfers in Los Angeles, but um, a very engaging and almost irritant view of the robustness of downtown Los Angeles. So just to conclude, I, I would say that muteness um, is really not about being indifferent or, or um, believing too much on indifference, but mute is, um, for us, is about being a specula a speculative on uh, of new forms of maybe transforming and repositioning uh, an icon that is maybe much less assertive, uh, but still kind of like forward looking and progressive. So as an architect, as an, an, as an educator, um, and this is just a completely personal, complete personal statement, I can't really imagine just producing boredom through projects, but instead 
actually uh, looking at moments that are interesting, even if at the same time they imply a delay in comprehension or a delay in understanding or a delay in um, legibility, but involving like social culture into, um, into architecture. So that's it, thank you. If nobody is falling asleep already. Hi, thanks, Georgina, for the um, great lecture. Quick question I think it's uh, fundamentally every practitioner and uh, kind of academician deals with this question of the real uh, in terms of you know, how the practice projects images outwards to, uh, to, the, to the real world, right? And, and it's so stunning and you're so honest with it. Here's the kind of crappy rendering and here's our rendering. Um, and I mean, I'm, 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 I'm with you, I, 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 I'm with you, definitely these are uh, far more interesting in the way they challenge our notion of how architecture can appear or how it could be speculated to appear. I'm, I'm curious through all this process uh, with the city agencies and uh, public in, uh, in Los Angeles, um, did you try to show these uh, to them? Uh, was there a kind of... Uh, maybe a uh, decision, no, no, don't show these, this is for a certain audience, and like we, we, we do the other renderings for the people who are gonna get it. And um, I, I'm asking this kind of, um, yeah, quite honestly, we, we deal with this dilemma all the time ourselves, because we find ourselves you know, showing images that we love and endear in our own way, uh, and then we get blank stares, like, what, what do you mean? Um, and I, I'm just curious about your uh, your experience in that. Um, we don't show them. <laughs> <laughs> um, they will get access to them because this is what we are going to do. But we also publish. So, uh, but I think there is almost a very silent agreement and common understanding between the different agencies that I mean there like there are different ways of communicating the same ideas and, and we have to I mean also learn to articulate a vocabulary that works for you know for each of these different audiences. Ultimately the, the, the ultimate result is common to all of us. So how you get there and again I'm, I'm not saying I'm not selling myself to say this is I mean I need this and, and I have like a whole uh, array of, of images to show but I mean, we do work, even though, I mean, I'm not sure, as I was saying before, this, is, this might not be my favorite render, it might be the one you like the most. But that tells me what I'm, what's coming. The other one talks about a narrative that for some people might not, I mean, they might not be very interesting. And of course, I mean, this, this hour is not educate the different agencies, but I mean, I think there is also our responsibility to try to, like, to drive messages. Of course, I mean, never using the right principle, but then in terms of the image itself, I think it's, I mean, there's so many different ways that we can get it to be seen. So it's a, that's why, I mean, I, I, I don't know, at least part of the lecture, I have to be also with you how we like to construct images and how we like to construct concepts because that you know, put together for a certain narrative and then you know, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for your lecture tonight. Uh, speaking of context, I can't help but think that since you're out in LA for such a long time, have you, first of all, lived through a an earthquake, and if you have, has that impacted your design sensibilities in any way? I can't help thinking that, you know, 
earth shaking would make any kind of architecture fuzzy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, awesome lecture. Um, so when you're designing a project, right, and, uh, and finding these dichotomies within the project, are you more inclined to allow the context to kind of create the dichotomy, or do you wait for the form to come along and allow that to drive you? Thank you. 